Hello and welcome to Corona Crisis. My name is David Haythornthwaite and I'm the chairman of AFC Filed. And over the next uh, few weeks and months, uh, I'm hopefully going to take you through what goes on behind the scenes of a non-league football team at times like this. Uh, we're going to discuss all the issues regarding uh, behind the scenes, the players, uh, off-field staff, all the things that contribute to the to the running of the club uh, and how we're dealing with the issues that have been thrown at us on a daily and weekly basis uh, so that it gives you a really good insight to the club uh, and the running of clubs in general so i look forward to you joining me on this journey david thank you for joining us once again as we continue to look at what's yep. going on behind the scenes at afc filed I think in this upcoming section now, we'd like to discuss the recent news about the filed women's team, uh, as well as looking at another another small section on finance with the reported payments that we received earlier from the Premier League. Okay. So, going into it, um, there obviously has been the news this week about their ladies team folding. It's been it's been sad news that's been you know spoken about at length online. Can we just get a little bit more of an insight as to why that decision was made? Yeah, um, as uh, as we discussed uh, you know, last time, uh, we're having to make some you know tough decisions on uh, on what we do at the football club uh, moving forward. Uh, and uh, you know the ladies team uh, <clears throat> at that time was uh, you know discussed uh, the cost of running that team and could we afford to justify that. Uh, in the current conditions, <clears throat> I must say that uh, you know since since that announcement was made uh, 24, 48 hours ago, you know we've uh, we've we've took. Uh, I've been amazed at the uh, uh, shall we say the uh, furor that, it, that it's uh, caused. Uh, I, I've I've never had so many media people uh, contacting me. I had Five Live wanting calling me and Sky Sports and various other people wanting to get my opinion um, and uh, also was you know been attacked I think quite unfairly uh, in my view on the social media by uh, by various keyboard warriors um, so I think it's important uh, like this whole whole sort of series of, uh, of uh, interviews uh, is about is, is to, to, to tell fans and it gives me the opportunity to tell fans, you know, really what's what's going on, what's happening. So uh, it's a really, really important subject, uh, and I think it matters that everybody gets, you know, what's what's happened and the truth. So I think the starting point is really to to go back to what, well, how did how did it come about in the first place? Uh, you know, the the development of a, a ladies team, and th those who, who've watched the earlier interviews in, in this series will know that my, my vision when, when I built Milk Farm, my vision still in building Milk Farm itself is, is to make it multi-sports. Uh, I, I, I've got a vision and my vision was to build the file brand. Uh, I'm from the file coast. Amazing if you go around the world and uh, you say you're from the file coast, no one has any idea where you're from, any idea. So if you say Blackpool, they go, Blackpool, where's that? So no one no one knows certainly where the file coast is and Blackpool is. Uh, so invariably, when I'm in a taxi or I'm checking in a hotel or I'm going somewhere on business, people say, where are you from? And over the years, I always say, I live near Manchester. And amazingly, this is the power which I love about football. Amazingly, the first question from the taxi driver, the guy checking me at the hotel, City or United? That's the first question. That's how big football is. Everybody knows Manchester because of football. So nobody knows the Fylde Coast. And anybody you know who lives on the Fylde Coast, those of us that do, know it's an amazing uh, place to live. It's an oasis, really, in, in, in the desert, shall we say. And it's got some wonderful villages, uh, some great towns such as Lillam St. Towns, and uh, where I'm fortunate enough to live, and, and it's just, it's a great area, it's a big, big agricultural area, big dairy area. And, and I wanted to, not just, was to, to build that brand. And that's, if you remember, going back when we changed the name from Kirkham and Westham, that was part of that programme, initial programme, 
to become filed. So the, 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 one of the reasons, the questions I always get asked is, how are we gonna build a football club? I know that's something you wanna ask me when you've got Fleetwood on your doorstep and Preston and Blackpool. So my idea was and is to build the file brand and to get everybody in the file coast behind that brand. And if we build that brand, maybe one day, not while I'm alive, but maybe one day when my son gets out of a taxi in New York and he says, where do you live? He says, I live on the file coast. He goes, oh yeah, you must support file ladies or file hockey. Or maybe, why not? If you don't have a dream and a plan and ambition, you never achieve anything. So that was my plan. And in order to, to build that brand, it was really, really important that it became more than just football because I wanted to involve all the community in it, not just people who were football fans. Interestingly enough, that project on a lot bigger scale, because remember we talked about earlier, billionaires and millionaires, that project is exactly what's happening at Bristol, uh, where Bristol are building Team Bristol. So Bristol, I've got the rugby club playing at Ashton Gate now, you know, the home of Bristol City. They've got a rugby club, they've got a basketball team, uh, I think they've got a racing team, and they're trying to build Peter Lansdowne, who, who owns it, from Hargreaves Lansdowne, he, he's a billionaire, he's a very successful guy, he's a Lancashire guy in actual fact, uh, has, has, is building that Bristol brand. And part of when we were developing the stadium and doing things, I was fortunate enough to go round Ashton Gate with all the redevelopment and talk to the ideas. I kind of had my idea before that, but it reinforced my belief that yes, this idea of building a brand about multi-sports is a good idea. A lot easier to do it when you've got a massive city like Bristol. More difficult to do it on the Fylde Coast. So that was my concept. And obviously, the only thing we had at that time was a football club, a men's football club. So one of the first opportunities, well, well they both came at the same time really, was that down, down the road in, uh, in, uh, in uh, I think uh, Ellswick, it's not Ellswick, it'll come to me where it is, but anyway, not far away is, is, was, was uh, is a very well-known site in our way, British Nuclear Fuels, it's a big nuclear, nuclear plant down there, uh, and they was known as Springfields many years ago, and they had a very, very famous uh, hockey club there. Uh, but like many works teams, uh, had lost that and become nomadic and played around Preston and various areas. But lots of the, the kids, when they left school, went to play uh, from the final area, went to play for Springfields Hockey. So uh, I approached them and said, look, you haven't got, you haven't got any, anywhere to play, you're nomadic. If you will come to Mill Farm and change your name to file Hockey, I'll build your hockey ground. I'll build your hockey ground. And we did, it cost about half a million quid. And it's, a fact, it's an amazing hockey ground. In actual fact, it's one of the six centers of excellence for English hockey in the whole country, one of six. That's the facilities are so good. So they came there and that was the first part, shall we say, of that jigsaw of bringing in final hockey clubs. So now we have, you can imagine the hockey audience, the hockey, People are totally different, a bit like rugby union and football, totally different than football. And they come and, and they've done really well. They're building their team. They're a really, really well-run organization. Everything that they said they'd do, they've done. It takes care of itself. I provide the pictures, I provide, uh, I've built them a fantastic, you, you'll have seen it yourself, Adam, a clubhouse and everything down there. So they've got a home. And when I pick up the paper, I read, Foul hockey, good win at the weekend. I go, yeah, it's working, I'm building that brand. Because we're talking about files. Almost at the same time, I can't remember which came first, but pretty much about the same time, <clears throat> I was approached by what was then Preston North End Ladies. That's what they were called, Preston North End Ladies. They were playing uh, at Bamber Bridge. That was where their home was. And there was no interest from Preston North End. Preston North End had no interest in, by the guy, uh, not having to go Preston North End here, but they had no interest in a ladies team. I don't think they've got one to this day. I don't think they have. So they came to me, had a meeting with the committee. The committee said, look, David, you know, we, 
would you be, could we, we build, you know, we're building a new stadium, we'd love to get involved. And I thought, wow, I can't believe this is happening. So I simply said, look, same as the hockey, if you'll change your name to Final Ladies, then I'd love to get you into that final family. Come along, thought, this is another piece in the jigsaw puzzle. They were also, they were already playing at a decent level. So we didn't have to go through, if you want the same pyramid I've been through with the men's team. And they had what seemed to be at the time a very active committee uh, and with self-financing, they had sponsors and funding and everything like that. So I said, okay, that's, we can do that. And very importantly, what I set out to do from day one <clears throat> was to treat the ladies team no differently than the men's team. I didn't want them to be second class citizens, if at all possible. And by that, I mean that I said to them at the time, look, we've got a new stadium and whenever possible, I want you to be able to play there. Now we've still got our own ground, Calamar Park. So should we say that's their second hole, Calamar Park. And that's significant because if you know anything about ladies football at lower level, at lower level we're wsl i think we're wsl2 so effectively we're in championship north if you want to compare it to the men's men's game most of those teams apart from your manchester cities and everything like that play never played the the the, 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 the men's team they don't play there so for example arsenal ladies i know play at boring wood play at Boreham Wood, which we play, that's where they play. No one gives them that equality of saying, you can go and play. Even Man City ladies, I think they've done a couple of things which are, shall we say, for want of a better word, um, publicity stunts. Well, yeah, Man City have played in the big stadium. I think Chelsea did for one game. But most games they play at, shall we say, not substandard facilities, but, but not nothing compared to the men's game. And I wanted to say to that team, you're not going to be second class citizens, if possible. So whenever possible, you can play at five. And by that, what I meant was, if there was, a, if there was, if I was playing Monday, Tuesday, sorry, Saturday, Tuesday, and then we were away on that Saturday, it wouldn't be possible because you can't destroy the pitch. The most important thing is the pitch to be able to play football. Uh, ironical, I'm saying that after after this year, but. That's what I wanted to do. But if there was no Tuesday game and then we were away on that Saturday, then on the Sunday, which is when the ladies play, they could use Mill Farm. So, and I can tell you that when they were entertaining teams such as Blackburn, we played Sunderland ladies, we played Leicester, we played a lot of premiership sides in that league. They were amazed when they came to our facility, go, wow, I can't believe you're allowed to play at this facility. So, I set out to do that from day one. Now, unfortunately, because of weather and various things, they probably only got to play there, certainly last season, because you know we had a disaster with the drainage and all the different things, probably 30%. In the first couple of seasons, they probably played 50%. This year, they'd have played at least 50% of the games at Mill Farm. So that's important to know that, that I set out and I still try and do that the facilities I've built for the hockey. I haven't built something on the cheap. I've tried to give them the first class facilities as the football have. So along come the ladies team with, shall we say, for want of a better word, their, their support team, their entourage. And like many things, uh, it quickly went pear-shaped. I don't know why, but the sponsor who was going to put all the money in to fund everything disappeared. Uh, the manager, there was a problem with the manager. I'm running a business, you know, it's never as easy bringing another business into your business. Bringing a ladies team into our organisation wasn't easy. So pretty quickly, I was picking up, picking up the cab, picking up the tab, when really I'd sort of not expected to be doing that. It wasn't kind of part of the bargain I entered into, but we were we were there. And 
Conrad came along, who's, who's the current current manager and, and been managed, I think, for two and a half years, something like that now. And, and, and we've run that team uh, relatively successfully. Um, but it costs a lot of money to run that team. And despite, despite Adam, <clears throat> everybody's, um, shall we say, attempt to promote ladies football, in my view, it's been unsuccessful, in my view. Uh, and there's been a lot of money thrown at it. And when you think that the Premier League, the FA, sorry, the FA throw 20 million at the ladies game, in other words, throw 20 million to give the, the ladies FA, the Premier League, 20 million pounds. Put that into perspective, the National League, we get through the, uh, th through the Premier League, we get about two and a half mil. Yeah, 90,000 a club. Remember I told you that earlier. The Premier League, yeah, 20 million to promote ladies football. Because they're trying to promote ladies football. I understand that. <clears throat> but it's very difficult. It's very difficult because there's still, in my, in my opinion, there isn't at grassroots football level the interest in ladies football like there is in other places. And let me give you an example of that. As you know, I lived in America for, for a long time, 13, 14 years, and that was 1984. And one of the things that struck me when I moved to America was, immediately, I couldn't, and that's 84, what's that, 30 years, 40 years ago, uh, you know, 30, 35 years ago. One that struck me then was, I couldn't believe on, on a Saturday how many kids were playing football, because it wasn't, it's not America's game, there isn't football at all, but how many girls, there was as many girls teams playing football, I mean literally girls teams, girls leagues, as, as there was boys. So it had an equal footing, if you want, from, from the get-go in, in America. And so that's why one of the reasons I think America's always had a successful ladies football team. Not, not this, far more successful than the men's football team. If you think about it, far more successful. And that's the reason why, because at grassroots there was an interest from school age of, and leagues and everything and playing football, that's not, not existed here. It doesn't today as I, as I know exist. So you're really trying to, you know, you're pushing uphill, you're trying to push water uphill, if you want, to try and make women's football work. Yeah, and it's important to know that, right? And I'm trying to do my little bit to make it work, but the, the, the appetite for it isn't good. So in the filed, in, 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 in the filed area, we've got a ladies team. We're the only ladies team, I think. Fleetwood haven't got a ladies at a low, much lower level. Blackpool haven't. Preston, as I said, haven't. So you think we've got a captive audience. I've got all I'm not competing on a Saturday. I'm competing against, you know, all the other football clubs, Fleetwood, Blackpool, Preston. They're all trying to get my fan, the, the same people I'm trying to attract to the game. But on a Sunday, ladies football. We're, we're the only show in town at Women's League 2, we're in championship equivalent. So it's pretty good standard. I say we're playing Sunderland, we're playing Leicester, we're playing Blackburn. Adam, if we get 100 people on that game, 100 people, and, it, and you know, we don't charge the same as we do for men's football, we're not charging 20 quid to come in, it's a fiver. And if you're a filed season ticket holder, you come in for free. So they can come in for nothing. We still only get 100 people. If you were to analyze those 100 people, most of them are parents or relations. So whether people like that fact or not, whether it doesn't sit well, and whether you're accused, you can accuse me of being, oh, well, you're being a sexist. Those are the facts. Those are the facts. There is no appetite from a spectator level from a spectator level, for women's football. And I, I, no one can argue that, I, I'm, it's self-evident. I'm doing it, I'm doing my best. I, want, I would love to see 5,000 in there, but it's, it's not there in my view. So here we have no appetite for really for, for the game. Not the reason that I've, I've finished it or, 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 or contemplating finishing. No appetite really. Everybody disappears who said initially they'd help out and I'm left sort of funding the whole thing, which again, as I've said 
in my earlier interviews, when everything's going fine, that's okay. Because in many ways, and this may sound strange to some of the people listening, you kind of put it to the back of your mind and pretend it the cost doesn't exist, if you will. It kind of, you don't want to get agitated by it. So, okay, it's a cost. Don't even look at the numbers. But once you've got a bad situation, you start looking at every number. You start looking at every cost. And interestingly enough, when I spoke to you last time, I said, oh, I think it was 35, 40,000. Well, once John T and I have sat down and done it, and John T pointed out, the cost of running that team is something that closer to 90,000 a year, 90,000 pounds, yeah? Again, no income, there isn't any income. You know, one of the things, you know, I go down there, even when you try to only charge in a five, it's no different than men's football, as everybody's trying to get through the back door and the side door and not pay, it's incredible. So there's no income, 90,000 cost. Just give you an idea, the wages, and just in case some people are surprised, we actually, yeah, we, we, we pay wages, down there, nothing like the men's, of course it isn't. But our wage bill for players and that is roughly about 4,000 a month. Well, it's not peanuts, it's not peanuts. So we had to sit down and say, first of all, we've got no support for that. There isn't an appetite from, from fans. It's not, being, it's not an appetite from volunteers stepping forward and, and trying to help and get involved. We haven't been able to find any sponsorship. I mean, it's hard to find sponsorship for the men's side, never mind for the ladies' side. Uh, and unlike the hockey, which has done a fantastic job in, in self-funding and looking after itself and has got a great volunteer and structure network to it, the ladies' football doesn't have that. And those are just the hard facts. So, so we had to make that, that choice that can we afford to pay in these difficult times to pay ninety thousand pounds out for something that in my view has little or no support little or no support and that's why we made the decision okay background since that time obviously when since we've made that announcement um, then amazing things often happened and uh, Within sort of two hours of the announcement, you know, my phone was going and, and I was having various proposals thrown to me. So the current situation on that, Adam, is that uh, we've had some proposals to continue uh, with the ladies team. Uh, and uh, I, I've said that uh, if we can make it cash neutral, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I understand that we'll never make it quite cash neutral, but uh, we we have certain costs. And, and just, to, just to give you an idea, and, and this is, uh, you know, health and safety, one of my biggest beefs, uh, is just to open, just to open up on, on a Saturday for a match day, at, on, on a Sunday, sorry. You can't just open the stadium. Although there's 100 people in, from a health and safety point of view, you have to have a head safety officer and you have to have three stewards, yeah, just to come in and look after 100 people. So straight away, you're into a few hundred quid there. Then you've got to have uh, 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 St. John's Ambulance, got to have that by standard, that's 80 quid. Match day officials, usually 130, 140 quid. We haven't gone through the door yet. We haven't got any players, we're not paying players for anything just to open up. I'm not talking about heat, light, power, groundsmen coming in, looking after the ground, all those things, just to open up Kalmar Park. Just, sorry, that's just to open up uh, Mill Farm. So those are the things that you, you have to deal with. Those are the reality that no one ever really thinks about with costs, yeah? On a match day, in, 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 uh, just to give an indication, on a match day, uh, for FC file, we have to have 27 stewards. 27 stewards, it's mad. But anyway, so that's where we're at with the, with the ladies. So they've come back and said to me, David, we don't want to lose it. Here's some plans. Will you consider keeping it, but it won't cost the club anything or virtually nothing? 
and, and those some of those costs I've talked about, well, we, we, we can't get rid of those. We, we'll have to live with those. So there, there could be sort of ten or 15,000 uh, costs. And I've said that if we can keep it within that region, then I'm certainly willing to support and look at the continuation of that ladies' team. So maybe, maybe uh, next time we, we talk, I'll be able to bring you the good news because for me it, 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 will good, it, it will be good news. If I don't have the ladies team, I've failed. You know, I've failed in my ability to try and grow uh, the, the file brand. So there's no one wants it, just to, to put the record straight, there's no one wants to have a ladies team more than me. I have to be honest and say, do I go down and watch it every Sunday? No, I don't. If I went watching ladies football, I wouldn't be divorced. From I get away with a Saturday, but we're trying to do our best, I say, to be as inclusive as possible with all different aspects of the community, not just men's football. Not to jump in, but it would be from the city talking to you now, it's clear that you are passionate about it then. So just to absolutely clear it up, we are now working on solving solving the issue of losing the team. We want to keep the team. Uh, it will just take some time to go over it. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, well, I, I say if 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 they if they can come back, and I say they, uh, you know, Conrad is is I suppose that he's the current manager, and he come back and you know, spoke to John T, our chief exec, and said, look, if we can put a package together that makes it almost cash neutral, or ten fifteen thousand, if you want to call that cash neutral, then uh, then would David reconsider the position and i've said immediately of course i would of course i would so yeah if, if i say if i'm sitting here in in a week's time when we do our, our, our annual ca a weekly catch-up and i can say yes we've got the problem solved there'll, there'll be nobody happier than me okay and that's a that's obviously a really positive news if we can get to that yeah. situation yeah. and yeah in the interim has it has this situation maybe shown you that if there is still a lot of passion for it, although there'll be people who will have been sending messages that may not yeah, be sending onto the game. When, when I say, listen, I'm, I'm not influenced at all. But there's, there's always a, a minority uh, who want to politicise things like this. You know, women's football is something that you know is, is a political football, if you excuse the pun. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I don't, you know, I don't care and I don't listen to keyboard warriors, I listen to the people that, that count. Um, and I also take into consideration the facts. And that's why I, I think these interviews give me the opportunity to, to give you the facts, to give, well not you, but to give the fans and anybody else who's listening, the, the, the facts about what happens with the women's game and the women's football and development of our team. Great. Okay, well, I, w I would like to think hopefully something positive can come from this. Yeah. Um, I know many other people certainly would as well. So we'll move on to a separate topic and hope to come back to that one at a later date. We were told, well, it was reported online, we were all sent a statement that there was money paid to us early from the Premier League uh, in, the, in terms of payments brought forward from next season. Has that been important to us at the minute? Has that been useful and have we used it? Yeah. Well, the answer is no. The answer is, the answer is no. No, no, no. Uh, on all three counts. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I was, you know, when I, when I sort of, it was announced, if you remember, probably three weeks ago now, at least three weeks ago, uh, that we were getting 125 million. We being EFL and the National League were getting 125 million <clears throat> from the Premier League. Wow, there they were, rode up on the big white horse and saved us all. And of course, that's great news for Sky Sports and makes Premier League look great. But the reality was, everything's in the detail. And when you get into the detail, what you found out was that all it was, was an advance of the normal support money that we get anyway. So again, just to remind everybody, we get 90,000 a year, yeah? And that's paid <coughs> throughout the season in tranches. So we get the last 12,000 
the current season, you don't get it straight away, uh, in, in June in the season. So yeah, that's 12,000. So, so far we've had 78,000, we do another 12. <clears throat> the 125 million filtered down to the National League, yeah, so that everybody was advanced, was an advanced payment, I think, of 56,000 against next year. So effectively, they're saying, we'll give you the money in advance to help you through those difficult times. But the problem with that is you've still got to pay it back. Or you're not paid back in this case, you just don't get it in September when you normally get it. So I thought it was scandalous, Adam. I thought it was scandalous. And, and I wrote immediately to uh, Michael Tadasol, uh, who's the chief executive of our league, and to Brian Barwick, to both of them and, and told them, you know, you, you, you know, you should go back to the Premier League and tell them that this is terrible. But um, they chose not to do so. Uh, and, 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 you know, I wasn't happy about that. I'm still not happy about that. Because it, it leads everyone to, to believe that, uh, you know, the Premier League are helping clubs out at the lower level. And that's not really true. Yes, of course, the Premier League do help us with funding and all the other clubs with funding. But it's not really the Premier League. It's Sky Sports, isn't it? Sky Sports is paying for it. They're paying for the Premier League and some of that money filters down to us. So it wasn't anything new. Uh, in my view, it didn't help. Just put a Band-Aid on it. I don't like Band-Aids. I like to fix a problem. Uh, and if we were going to get it in September anyway, then our budgeting should plan accordingly not to say, oh, great, we've got this money, let's use it now. Because when we come to September, we'll be in a mess. So really, in, 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 in the short term answer, I don't think it's been any good at all to us. That doesn't mean that some clubs that are potentially on the brink, uh, it, it, it may help them. But I think it's... Uh, I think uh, I think I used the expression when I wrote to uh, Michael Tattersall, and that's what I know I did. I said, look, it, it's like giving a, a, a man who's dying of cancer morphine. It's uh, wonderful, takes away the pain for a few hours, but doesn't cure the cancer. Uh, and uh, so it will help some people who've maybe got terminal cancer live a little bit longer, uh, in, 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 so to speak, in, in football terms. Uh, but... Uh, I don't believe it does. If you want to give help people at this level, it needs to be new money, not existing money dressed up in a different way. It is important to add there, I think, that this is, you, you touched on it a little bit, but obviously this is the fight, the impact of the money on AFC file, whereas other clubs, like you say, may have benefited from it currently, but will have to find further funding down the line. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's only brought forward. I think maybe you would have got that in September. I can't remember when we get it, September, October, maybe some of it in August. Uh, and instead of getting that, you, you, you're getting it now. So it's, you, you know, the, the issues facing, and I don't want to try and go through it too much, but the issues facing most clubs is going to be in July the 1st, when if the furloughing payments stop, which I think they will, or they'll be certainly at a much reduced rate. Chancellor's already hinted at it this week. When they stop on June, July the 1st, and people have got players on contract, then they have got to find they're going to have, that's when we're going to have serious problems, really serious problems, because that's when there's no season ticket income, because no one's going to buy a season ticket. I've gone through all those things. So that money, could potentially help, I say, someone who's on life support live a little bit longer. But I really believe that's all you're doing is you're just stretching out the agony. Because I still don't think, and I don't what, what you think, Adam, but I don't think we're going to see football played in front of crowds before January 2021 at our level. I don't believe that. And, Already we've seen this week we, that Germany now have decided maybe they've made a mistake with letting people sort of go out again and they're considering because of the coronavirus bringing people back onto lockdown. The first thing that's going to happen is football. So I think that uh, 
I think that it's a uh, it's it's a short term I say band aid fix, but doesn't help in my view. Okay, thank you for answering those questions. That's okay.